All right, folks. Um, I figure we might as well get going. There'll probably be some stragglers, um, as there usually is for these sorts of affairs. So for those of you that don't know me, I tried to get around and introduce myself. I'm Gary Rowe um, with USGS. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for the National Water Quality Program. Um, I sit in Denver, Colorado, but uh, these days I seem to get out to D.C. and rest in at least a fair bit. Um, we're happy to have you here today for our National Liaison Committee meeting for the uh, National Water Quality Program. Um, just to kind of remind folks, um, in 2016, the uh, USGS realigned the funding lines for what used to be uh, water quality work in the water mission area. So as you all know, this used to be the NACWA program that Pat helped start back in the day. Um, so the NACWA piece, they basically combined NACWA uh, with our National Atmospheric Deposition Program, our National Park Service Cooperative Water Quality Program, and the water quality pieces of our Cooperative Water Program and our National Research Program. So all those pieces now fall under one banner and a single appropriation that's made for water quality work within the USGS Water Mission Area. Um, so NACWA was traditionally funded around 50, high 50s, low 60s, and now the overall funding with those other pieces added in is about $90 million. Um, with respect to FY18 funding, uh, the omnibus contained a slight bump for us. We went from 90.5 to 90.8 million. Um, you know, we were just happy to get an increase. Um, we're still waiting to allocate that money. There's the, the rescission talk and some uh, spending plan reviews that the department's doing, but you know, we've been continuing to do our data collection and our modeling and our work. So what you're going to hear about today, uh, uh, because we've kind of moved to the National Water Quality Program emphasis, we're going to start in this meeting and future meetings bringing in other elements of NWQP. And today, for example, we're going to be talking about harmful algal blooms. Now, NACWA is doing some work, and you're going to hear about that today on HABs. Um, but there's most of the other current work is actually being done in our water science centers through cooperative studies. And, um, you're going to hear uh, from Jennifer Graham, who works in our Kansas Water Center, the work that her office is doing in cooperation with Tom Stiles. So we brought in an outside person, uh, Tom, to give a you know sort of the external stakeholder and cooperator perspective on you know what uh, they're doing uh, in partnership with USGS, what he likes and doesn't like, and areas you know for future collaboration. And so. Uh, you know, the purpose of this meeting really is, again, as it always is, is for you folks uh, that know us, know our work, um, to hear about what we're up to and provide feedback on, um, you know, things you like, things you don't like, future directions we could be going, things we should be aware of uh, that we may not be aware of that we can, you know, potentially partner or collaborate on. Well, great. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming today. So I guess I'll start off. I'm going to, you know, let's jump right into it. What we're going to do is we're going to have three presentations from Tom, Jennifer, and Paul. Um, and after each presentation, we'll have some time for discussion and questions. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll have a productive uh, next hour and 45 minutes or so. So our first speaker is Tom Stiles. He's with the Kansas uh, Department of Health and Environment. Um, he's been working with Kansas on water issues for, I think, 36 years. And he knows he participates uh, in ACWA and other organizations related to water, one of our leaders here. And again, he brings a perspective of working hand in hand uh, with Kansas, USGS Kansas Water Science Center, Jennifer in particular. And they have a long history of working on HABs issues in Kansas. And so um, we're going to have Tom tell us about that and provide some perspectives, some ex outside perspectives on that work. So, Tom? As Gary's setting up, I want to thank uh, USGS for having me come out. Uh, I'm not only going to give a state's perspective, I'm going to give a Midwest perspective, which may be somewhat different than what uh, people along the coast experience when it comes to uh, harmful algal blooms. Certainly, we are purely a freshwater situation. We don't have anything relative to the marine or estuaries, etc. So, our perspective, and the other aspect is, for a state like Kansas, we're, we're semi-arid, so and we really don't have lakes, we have reservoirs. Uh, and they were constructed ostensibly for flood control, but they've also uh, feature water supply functions, uh, as well as recreation. And for a state where 99% of the lands are privately held, uh, the availability of, of public recreation at our lakes is, is paramount. 
And so as harmful algal blooms is, is impinging upon that, the public has raised their collective awareness on, on water quality. Uh, so just start off with the basics. What is an algal bloom? Uh, it's in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, we know that there are high cell, uh, cell count densities. They tend to be monocultures uh, dominated by one species or maybe a couple. Um, and the most, from the lay perspective, the most important thing is they're visible. Uh, not only they're visible, but they're noticeable. They uh, give off odors. Uh, and as you come into contact with them, you may or may not have, to have a reaction. Not all these blooms are necessarily toxic. Uh, and not all toxins necessarily come from these blooms, but for them, uh, what this really is, and for those of us that have been in the, the science field and dealing with water quality for years and decades, what this has become is the final, the manifestation of the impact of what is eutrophication, the excessive application of nutrients and presence in our, in our, in our waters there. Uh, for decades we've said our waters probably have too many nutrients contained within them. This is the bulk of the iceberg from those early tips that, that, we, that we saw. The, the most important thing is for in our world, again, the public generally doesn't get water quality. They don't understand what we do, uh, but they understand when things go off the rails. Harmful algal blooms is, for a lot of the public, is something's gone terribly wrong. I can no longer use my lake. And that makes it a little more personal to them. And so while we're dealing with the crisis, we also need to seize the opportunity to make some inroads on how important water quality management is. Um, and in expressing it for us scientists, I mean, we view them as cyanobacteria. Uh, for managers, it's essentially it is harmful algal blooms. For the lay public, it's blue-green algae. So it comes in many shapes and, and, and forms, but it all basically represents the culmination of excessive nutrients and an, and an ecosystem that has gone horribly out of tilt. For Kansas, sitting in the middle of the country, uh, semi-arid, it's uh, climatically diverse. We have 10 inches of rainfall out on the west borders, and it runs 36 to 40 inches on the east. But as you can see from the map, and when we started in earnest, looking at uh, reports on harmful algal blooms since 2010. Essentially no quadrant of our state has been immune to suffering, seeing their lakes suffer from this phenomenon. Uh, and it's come to a peak with our, our, our main problem child. Some, you know, for many it's Lake Erie uh, or down in Florida, St. Lucia, or Utah Lake. For us, it's Milford Lake. Uh, it's our largest lake, uh, and I'm usually calling things lake. There are, in fact, reservoirs, but I'll, I slip in and out of that vernacular uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it has a strong regional water supply function. It supplies water to the Kansas River that heads out from its outlet and heads eastward to, to Kansas City. Of course, it's got a flood control function for the Republican River, which, which uh, represents its, its watershed. But it's also our primary, one of our primary regional recreation centers. Uh, prize blue ribbon uh, walleye fishing, uh, many uh, Bassmaster tournaments. It, it represents for the lay public the, the ultimate in terms of a recreation uh, type of uh, situation, both from the fishing perspective as well as jet skis and, and, and so forth uh, throughout its, its water body. Uh, 2011, the lake blew up on us, and this was in part because of uh, the way the Corps had to manage it because of the Missouri River floods and had to hold water back for months at a time over the summertime period. And that water just, bit with chock full of nutrients, basically had a chance to get warm and it took off with a, our largest mega bloom that we had seen up to that point in time. Uh, ever since then, then we followed that with two years of drought and we saw subsequently the bloom numbers dropping off because the influx of, of nutrients coming in from that spring of the spring inflows had diminished considerably because of drought conditions and the blooms correspondingly were quite moderate. And then it was followed by back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back years of 
extensive blooms that were highly intense in terms of their magnitude, in terms of cell counts, or toxin uh, concentrations, predominantly microcystin, and just duration, with the blooms essentially <coughs> happening around 4th of July, plus or minus a week, and then continuing on past Veterans Day. So there was a strong persistence to, to the, uh, the blooms there in Milford. 2017 was represent a little bit more moderate condition, but part of that again was partly due to water manipulation by the port, the core to consistently draw water off the reservoir and essentially essentially not let the bloom accumulate in, in one area. It's a complex lake in terms of its, its its shape and how again because it is essentially an inundated valley. Uh, and in looking at it, and as you sample it, you know, does one sample represent the lake as a whole? In many of our lakes, uh, that is the case. We, if we sample one place, we know what's going on throughout the lake. But in Milford, we wound up zoning it uh, because conditions were quite different as we moved from the, its headwaters down toward the outlet at the dam. And with the headwater area, essentially representing uh, ground zero for our problems with harmful algal blooms and consistently the area that was hammered time and time again by the uh, impairment issues associated with, with the HAB itself. Um, conversely, zone, Z zone A down at the bottom was relatively left untouched. It suffered occasional blooms there in some of the coves and where the state parks are and the marinas and, and the beaches. And toxin levels would occasionally be there, but they were much, much more moderate. And so during the duration of any given summer, while the upper part of the lake was just chock full of a, with uh, cell counts and associated toxins, the lower part tend to ebb and flow a little bit with uh, the essentially the prevailing wind condition, and more often than not, was still able to maintain its its recreational function. Uh, these are annual averages of the microcystin toxin levels there, and we follow the the, the WHO guidelines of of that 20 part per billion. Uh, once we see toxin levels up and over that, we issue warnings there. Now, Frank, we use two criteria: we use we use toxins and we use cell counts, and I'd say 90 percent plus of our public alerts are driven by cell counts. The cell counts are always escalate much faster and the toxins come along after the fact a little bit later. But as you can see generally from the uh, 2011 period there where we initially saw uh, the elevated uh, situation of, of uh, the bloom along with and the toxins that were there throughout the lake both in the upper zone and as well as down by the dam followed by the drought condition and then again our three stressful years of 14 through 16 uh, peaking out at over a thousand part per billion for toxin as an average over the summertime period that, that we collected it and then in diminishment last year again uh, partly because we were able to essentially stretch the bloom out over the lake and not let it accumulate to uh, such uh, critical critical conditions this is where we utilize USGS's health because uh, we were often accused of cherry picking, of going out and finding conditions such that we could basically make a worst case situation. Essentially drawing it from a scene from Jaws, saying there's no real problem here, according to the locals. This is the way it's always been. Uh, and you guys are just looking for the trouble area, sampling it, then using that to base your, to back up your, your pronouncements in terms of alerting the public, which is, which is killing our business, by the way. Um, we had, uh, employed USGS to help us out on this, and uh, in 2015, uh, we went out and collected all three agencies, ourselves, USGS, the Corps of Engineers, who routinely sampled their light. We all collected in the manner that we did simultaneously. Now, KDHE samples along the shoreline, uh, basically where the highest probability of public exposure is going to be with people wading, swimming, etc. There and those were always the data that were used to uh, base our, our pronouncements in terms of the relative level of concern that the public should be aware of. Uh, USGS basically ran down through the lake and just did random draws out of the out of the water column, and Corps of Engineers 
basically ran transects in various spots along the lake, uh, back and forth, uh, across the lake. USGS analyzed those data and basically came back and said, it doesn't matter who samples, where they sample, when they sample, the general conclusion of the relative risk to the public is always the same. And that basically emboldened us to basically say, we're not cherry picking, that we're basically basing on the facts that of what we're sampling there is, is, does in fact represent the immediate threat to the, to the public relative to that. So this was very, very helpful for us to basically do that. And it does back up the fact that as you see with the red dots up in zone C, that's problematic. Those were very high levels there. The transition zone of zone B began to moderate that out. And then again, that zone A, where most of the recreation did in fact occur oftentimes, uh, it was still held pretty harmless. The impact is that when we made public pronouncements, Zone C would be isolated as saying that's the problem area. But you can still enjoy the lake down in Zones B and A. More than hard science, sometimes all you've got to do is get some information to make some observations. And these blooms are incredibly dynamic. Uh, these are from uh, fixed uh, cameras that USGS established on the upper end, and they basically showed how quickly conditions change. Uh, the top one was early in July of 16, in where the bloom is there along the shore, and one hour later, it's been swept back out into the lake. It's gone. I mean, stripped clean off the shore. Uh, followed toward the latter part of July, Within a 15 minute period there, we see moderate conditions uh, at that location. Filed that 15 minutes later, the bloom is sitting right on top of it as well. So using these photographs, we basically said, with our sampling, yes, we basically are looking at more in terms of patterns than incidents, and that these conditions are so dynamic that it may be bad now, and then when you go out a half hour later, it might be clear, but believe me, the bloom's coming back it comes back and forth. And so just the only way we can stay on top of it is to basically sample throughout the perimeter of the lake and then basically say the pattern that has been holding over time is basically representing our, our, the input of what we make relative to, to management. This isn't hard science, but it's one of the most important features of science is just making observations of what's going on there. That is, and it's visible, and it's, and it's optic. And that is what the public responds to. But you can't be out there all the time. So we employ USGS to put in real-time sensors to begin to say, is there some type of signal we can see relative to when blooms are starting to pick up? And they've and USGS pioneered the use of these real-time sensors to look at water quality uh, on a continuum, a continuous basis, a lot of data being generated there. And as is the case with most water quality data, it's pretty noisy. But what we found is that as the sensor is looking and things are relatively stable and calm, there's no bloom out there. All of a sudden we start getting noisy data and it basically is the harbinger of a bloom is developing. And then the sustaining of that throughout the remainder of, of July of, of, of 2016 showed that bloom was there to stay for a while there. And the sensor of the Fiano site, uh, which has been very uh, pigment keyed to the cyanobacteria, has been really helpful, more so probably than chlorophyll, in being able to sort out when we've got these harmful algal blooms taking hold relative to that. And the, the beauty is we don't have to be there necessarily. We can begin to trust the instrumentation to tell us what the situations are. So much so that we then, along with ambient data that we collect, we can start developing relationships between what the sensors are picking up and how it relates to actual ambient data coming from the water column there. And looking at that, using sensor data to basically say, what's the probability of conditions there? And this basically follows along the same line in 2016, where it basically starts out as low condition, clear condition. We start slipping into maybe, okay, you need to be somewhat, the public needs to be aware, keep your head on a swivel, blooms are developing, and then all of a sudden we're in warning stage. And this is all driven by what the sensors are telling us there that tends to back up what our then we ground truth week in and week out with our own sampling there that says the blooms are there. 
Again, for the public, we're only there once a week, but the sensors back it up and say, while you were gone, here's what's happened there. Very, very important for us to convey this sense of dynamics across time as we work through the recreating week there, after we've been there. So you can set up with regressions, and this is the beauty, has always been the beauty of real-time sensors, is that you get sensor data, such as uh, uh, the, the, the pigments associated with, with the uh, cyanobacteria, and you match it up with the toxins that result, for, that are produced by the cyanobacteria. And this is an incredibly tight relationship that we picked up with our sensor in the northern end of, of Milford Lake that allowed us then to make projections on terms of, because in the end, the cell counts don't really matter that much. They basically represent the potential problem. The toxins are the real problem. Well, by using uh, the sensor data and then letting USGS run out on boat and doing transects across there with a sensor, they're able to essentially map out the lake of the relative concentrations of, of toxins that are present there. And again, the upper part is just hammered with toxin. And then we slip into some transition and we're relatively clear on the lower end there. Again, the message is the upper end for the general public is typically should be avoided, but you can still enjoy the lake down at the, south, the southern end of, the, of, of it. It's not just a lake issue. 2011 introduced the notion of, well, again, these are reservoirs, and the reservoirs support the downstream river reaches. Well, once the core let loose of the water after the floods on the Missouri subsided, uh, and Milford had been up 10, 10, 15, 20 feet up, they started letting it loose. And it had a noticeable impact of setting a signal of microcystin toxin on the Kansas River. The Kansas River represents the majority of our surface water suppliers that probably supply up to two-thirds of the population of the state. This freaked them, uh, and, there, and then they embarked USGS to begin a long-term study to examine how toxins are being transmitted downstream along the river reaches by the reservoirs. Predominantly, again, Milford being the, 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 sort, the primary source, source of that. The upshot, and from here, we can definitely see that from those conditions 2011, there was definitely a slug of toxin delivered to the river. And then it basically, no, no, but no other tributary, no other reservoir was contributing, and so there was almost a dilution effect. And so we saw a, a sliding out of those concentrations as it worked, the river worked its way toward the Kansas City metro area and the Missouri River. The subsequent follow-up studies by the public water suppliers and USGS basically said, you know, this is kind of a perfect storm. It doesn't happen all that much, which was gratifying, saying we could focus our attention back up on the lake itself, where the primary conditions were, and that while the public water suppliers can maintain some level of vigil uh, in anticipation of these uh, occasional inserts of, of toxin into the, into the river system, they generally are not something to worry about. Frankly, taste and odor issues were much more prevalent from the river than, than the presence of microcystin. Again, very gratifying information to basically say, not only it's just not that common an occurrence, but also when it does occur, the, the, the public water suppliers can be ready to apply activated carbon and treat it out. We have never had a breakthrough in finished water of any type of our, our toxins, either microcystin or cylindrospermopsin. So our public water supplies have maintained a clean record in delivering toxin-free water. Well, we've got a science shift because we're now understanding the dynamics of the bloom and the bloom are the public, uh, publicly aware effect of all this. But the shift has to go to, okay, let's get to the cause. Uh, why, and, uh, why, uh, why is this happening? And why is it happening so prevalently and so vigorously on a lake like Milford Lake? We had USGS go out and begin to track uh, biologically available phosphorus, ortho P, uh, from the, the river inlet and then in, throughout zone C. And we saw ortho P concentrations up between, averaging around, uh, half a milligram per liter. 
that's unheard of for Kansas surface water, let alone a lake. We typically are see non-detects with orthope. And here it was just chock full of orthope. Okay, that's a question. Why is that orthope so high? And why is it so uniquely high to this lake? That's the new question. We've got core, the core of engineers goes out and samples monthly uh, throughout the recreation season from April through October. They've typically done that for years. And they've noticed the same phenomenon. And they've noticed a couple things. Uh, over time, the level of phosphorus and orthope has risen over time, over with year by year. Within a given year through the season, the level of phosphorus and orthope rises up toward the late summer, early fall period there, which coincides with the period when the Republican River really isn't flowing all that much. So it's not necessarily coming in from, from the river. Uh, and again, these are ungodly amounts of orthophosphorus and biologically available phosphorus that is up in the upper river, upper, upper lake, that we just never see anywhere else. So what? So what's happening there? So our attention shifts from what the watershed's contributing to what do we have in terms of the internal cycling of the phosphorus that's already embedded within both the biota and the sediments of that upper, upper portion of, of Milford Lake. Well, it does take watershed. When you have a, a reservoir, which is essentially an impoundment, its water quality clearly reflects everything. It, it's basically the cumulative effect of everything that's come down from its watershed. Um, and it causes me to remember back when we took limnology classes, the, the concept of the lachlanus sources and autochthonous sources, those that are coming from outside the lake and those that are being generated within this lake. And that's certainly depicted by this by this the display there of all the potential sources of nutrients that uh, can, can go in. And so we potentially have during the springtime inputs coming in from the watershed. I mean, it is a rural state. It is highly agricultural. And we and during runoff period, we see uh, nutrients moving from the landscape back on down to the reservoir. What happens to them there is the question. Do they basically go down and get into the sink and never to be seen again? Or in these upper areas there that tend to be somewhat shallow, do we start seeing some level of recycling and resuspension and renewed bioavailability that fuels fuels the, uh, the activity of the bloom? And we've just been looking at phosphorus. We have not hardly touched on, on the nitrogen, but these, the blooms are definitely and the lakes are definitely nitrogen limited there. So what is the role of nitrogen to basically trigger and then sustain the bloom as well? Recognizing that nitrogen is the more volatile of the two, of the two nutrients and that there are many pathways for it, for it to go, including up, up into the atmosphere. So my closing takes there from the state's perspective and teeing it up for uh, Jennifer and, and Paul is here's what the states need. We need three things. We need research to begin to understand the things that we don't know. Um, we need science to basically back up and verify uh, and apply what we believe is the case. And certainly that's the case with things like nutrient cycling. Uh, and we need more than anything. We need data and observations to verify that our belief system and our working hypothesis is holding so that we can begin to address and translate science into management to begin to abate these types of blooms. The dynamics of the blooms and the biology of the blooms still is something open for research and there have been many takes on what drives the bloom including why do some blooms go bad and produce toxins while others remain benign. Uh, nutrients and nutrient cycling is basically application of, of the science that we know. But it, both of those have to be backed up by the acquisition of data. And again, USGS has been poised perfectly to explore innovative ways to collect data to help shed some of the light on these areas that we don't know or to test our working hypothesis. The beauty also is that USGS is neutral. They have no dog in the fight. And so from the state's perspective, my closing mark is, and for the youngsters here, they probably won't get it, but we just need USGS to be Joe Friday. Just need the facts. Appreciate the time and the privilege of talking to you today. Thank you very much.
Gary, one, one last thing. One other thing. Aqua, over uh, fall and winter, put out a, a survey uh, for the states looking at how we're managing uh, nutrients and looking at them, both from the point source perspective and non points perspective, as well as what we're finding in trends. The findings relative to trends were most telling in that the most dominant answer that came back in terms of how are you seeing trends in either nutrients or the manifestations, whether it's dissolved oxygen or pH or uh, chlorophyll, et cetera. The most prevalent answer was, I don't know, it's unclear. That's an area ripe for exercising research, science, and data acquisition to help us sweep away some of that unclear and allow us to begin to see whether efforts we've made to move the needle are effective or not. Thank you, Tom. We've got time for some questions, comments, or Tom. Tom, I was impressed with the, the, the role USGS is playing as a neutral party. But does the public view it that way? Uh, do all parties view it that way? Or uh, what does it mean exactly? Well, when we're out in public and making a presentation like this, USGS is up there, frankly, emotionless because all they're doing is presenting the facts. Uh, here's what it, it isn't. Here's what it should be, or here's what it could have been. It's here's what it is. The agencies are responsible for regulating water quality, or the Corps is, regular, is responsible for managing the uses of the reservoirs. And so as you impart management decisions in there, we're making policy decisions. USGS isn't imparting policy. The state agencies or the core, the managing agencies are imparting policy. The public can recognize facts, and then they can start addressing or attacking us relative to the chosen policy we've taken to take those facts and, and, and put forth and produce that, that policy. So I would say yes, the USGS has not been stained by uh, 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 any connotation of bias whatsoever because of the way they not only collected the data but also in the way they present the data which is cool, calm, and collected. So Jennifer Graham works with our USGS uh, Kansas Water Science Center out of Lawrence. Uh, she is our de facto HABS expert in the water mission area. And she's been with the USGS, either a volunteer and then an official employee, about 15 years, 13 in Kansas. And uh, she represents the USGS on the Habarca, the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research Control Amendment Act. I'm not, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Uh, interagency working group uh, with EPA, NOAA, and a bunch of other folks. And so she's going to kind of she, uh, she picked up a copy of this uh, OFR at the table. She was a lead author on this, and this really was put together to kind of uh, document USGS science capabilities with respect to HABs and outlining you know, areas of future research, kind of the niche we occupy right now, where we might go in the future. So uh, we asked Jennifer to kind of come in and, and give an overview talk on some examples of our most recent work. So, Jennifer. Hey, thanks. So Tom talked about um, the Kansas experience, and I think that is an experience that a lot of our states will echo. Um, harmful algal blooms are a national problem, and they're a global problem. A lot of our effort has been focused on our inland freshwater um, lakes and reservoirs, and also in our coastal and marine areas. But we're learning that harmful algal blooms are affecting all of our nation's waterways from our smallest streams into our coastal estuaries and marine systems. And so this is a big problem um, in all of our water bodies. And so I'm going to give you an overview of some of the work that, that we're doing to really start to explore some of those other places that we're seeing harmful algal blooms develop. Tom talked about what a bloom is. Um, I want to touch on what makes some blooms harmful. Because again, this really depends on your perspective and where you're sitting. A lot of the emphasis in the harmful and harmful algal blooms is on how they affect human health. Um, we, we know that they produce some potent toxins that can result in human illnesses um, and in rare cases, human deaths. Um, and there are multiple exposure routes. So that's really been a, a lot of the focus of what we do. But um, these types of blooms also have major impacts on ecological health, on upper. Um, 
part of the slide is uh, an example from Florida where there was a major fish kill, and this kind of uh, this kind of event really affects and alters ecosystem processes. We don't know a lot about what those impacts are, and that's really an open area of research. Um, another issue then is the economic and aesthetic concerns Tom mentioned, the loss of recreational revenues in, from vendors. Um, again, this is another area, open area of science, really, is how do we value um, economic impacts of blooms like this or something that affects all of Lake Erie. And the 2014 drinking water event in Toledo has had some preliminary economic work done, and that work estimates that that individual event resulted in $65 million of lost benefits. 43 million of those benefits were associated with the recreation and tourism injury industry. Uh, about 14 million were associated with uh, <coughs> proper, property values, property losses, and then 4 million was associated with the drinking water treatment for that event. So events like this, we don't have a lot of those kinds of numbers, but they can have very high price tags. We talk about um, how common are toxic cyanobacterial blooms. I think this is really something that's occurring across the nation. This map illustrates two, um, two different points and again, this is something that we have updated um, continually as we get more information. Um, I want to emphasize that right now we don't have a great um, common reporting database for when and where toxin blooms are, are occurring. We have made a lot of progress. Leslie Day and Glada keeps a great record and sends out monthly reports, which is a long going, I mean, it's further than we, we were before. CDC has a One Health Harmful Algal Bloom reporting system where events can be input, but we really, it's really tough to go out and quantify at any given time across the nation how many, um, how many toxic blooms are experiencing, we're experiencing and what those human health impacts are, what the effects are on our companion, um, companion pets, um, wildlife, things like that. So on this map, all the states that are colored in green um, are states where there have been some kind of anecdotal report of either a human or animal illness or death associated with a toxic cyanobacterial bloom. And as you can see, most of our states are affected. And I will say, since we put this map together, there have been a couple. South Carolina has also started reporting some incidents in fresh waters. Um, and so it's, it's widespread and common, but again, this is anecdotal, and those were really gleaned from newspaper reports and things like that, or word of mouth. And so um, I think that if we look, just because states aren't affected or aren't shaded here, it doesn't mean they aren't having problems here. It means their reports aren't in a location where they're easy to find. And then just to illustrate how widespread this issue can be, particularly during summer months, um, in our fresh waters, the states that have hashes through them um, are states that had um, some kind of health or recreational advisory for cyanobacteria in freshwater during August 2016. And there were 19 states that were affected at that time. So again, this is widespread and common. This is an issue that we're dealing with. So one of the things that USGS has done um, in partnership with other agencies like EPA, um, we have gone and really tried to quantify how often are we seeing toxins in the environment and where are they where are we seeing them? So we partnered with EPA in the 2007 National Lakes Assessment to look at um, occurrence of several different types of cyanobacterial toxins. The microcystins are the most commonly occurring in the U.S. and they're the most commonly occurring worldwide. So that's really where we focus right now. Um, but during the National Lake Assessment, these lakes were sampled once, sometime during the summer, um, May to September in 2007, and they were sampled in open water areas. So this is really just an ambient snapshot of what was out there at that point in time. And 32% of lakes across the nation had detectable microcystin at that point. Those are indicated here in blue. That's fairly widespread. When we start to look at those concentrations that are of concern for public health con protection, again, using that 20 micrograms per liter by the World Health Organization, um, those are the red triangles. And those were relatively rare during this particular study. And so um, there have been some other regional studies that show the same kind of pattern that while the microsystems are widespread and common throughout the nation, those high concentrations that really start to cause concern are, are relatively rare. That this study was a single snapshot at one point in time and wasn't focused on blooms, and we know that there are other toxins out there. So we did a study um, in the Midwest 
where we went actually, we went out to lakes that we knew were experiencing blooms at that time and we sampled, we cherry picked. This was an example of what happens when you do cherry pick. And um, there, there are a lot of things going on here. We were there were a couple of questions we were trying to answer, but we really wanted to look at mixtures because that's, again, in, in this field, that's not something that we've really focused on. When we're talking about recreational um, public health protection or we're talking about drinking water treatment, um, the cyanobacteria can produce a whole bunch of different compounds that are concerned. There's the toxins, there's taste and odor compounds that don't have human health impacts but can greatly have effect aesthetics of drinking water quality. And so really we wanted to know what was going on with mixtures. And so there are a couple of things that came out of this study. One was that every single bloom that we cherry picked had detectable levels of microcystin and we saw really high microcystin concentrations in, in this. All of these had had levels that were uh, around or above that 20 microgram per liter threshold. The highest that we saw here was 17,000 micrograms per liter, which is a lot. Um, as an aside, in some of the work that we've done on Milford Lake in Kansas, the highest we've detected there is about 350,000 micrograms per liter. So we're talking, there are cases where there's a lot of toxin up there. So really, the more interesting thing here was that almost every bloom that we sampled had a mixture. And um, about 30% of the blooms had multiple toxins and that creates challenges um, for treatment because not all toxins are removed the same way and it causes problems when talking about public health protection because the different toxins have different toxicities and different mechanisms of action. Uh, and then again, the fact that um, I think over 90% of these blooms also had taste and odor compounds. And again, when we're talking about drinking water treatment concerns, um, it's complex and it's complicated. Um, so mixtures are out there and that's something that we're gonna really need to start to look at and start to tackle. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our work had really focused on lakes and reservoirs with, with the um, cyanobacteria in particular because we can see them there. We can see the blooms accumulating. Um, but we had the opportunity to go out and look at small stream sites as well. And so we took that opportunity um, in a regional assessment in the southeastern United States and um, we just collected some samples for cyanotoxin analysis and in this particular study, 38% um, of the small stream sites that were sampled had detectable levels of microcystin. This was surprising. When we, when we started this study, I think the, the thought was, well, we're going to do this and we're not going to find anything and we can kind of cross that off the list, but we didn't. And really, this study um, was enlightening and it, opens, it really opens a lot of doors and raises a lot of questions where maybe our small streams aren't necessarily huge um, exposure routes for people. Um, but they might be for pets or for livestock, and there might be a huge ecosystem effects here as well. And so again, this opens up a whole new area of questions that we can ask and things that we should be looking towards. So this is small streams. Um, in 2015, um, there was the event on the Ohio River that affected hundreds of miles, multiple states, multiple drinking water supplies. and. Um, this event, it, it captured a lot of tension, but we asked the question, you know, we, we know that sometimes there's a perfect storm where we will see events in rivers. Tom talked about what we saw in the Kansas River. We know in the San Francisco Bay, there's systems that occasionally export microcystin into the bay and cause um, <coughs> sea otter issues and, and other marine life issues. Uh, and we see reports like this and what we saw down in, in Florida in 2016. But there aren't a lot of data out there documenting how common the cyanobacteria, the cyanotoxins are in large rivers. And so um, the NACWA project uh, started to have pilot last summer um, to really look at occurrence in large rivers. And so our objectives were to describe cyanotoxin occurrence in the large river systems that we selected, and then also look for the potential for harmful algal bloom occurrence using a combination of traditional approaches like microscopy, looking for cyanobacteria, and chlorophyll, but also look, using some of the emerging approaches like genetics and some of the sensor technology that Tom mentioned. So we selected 11 sites across the nation that represent a range of water quality conditions. Um, we also looked for sites that already had um, instrumentation in place. Um, 
water quality sensors in place and about half of our sites had that um, available. And then all of these have some kind of drinking water significance. They're not necessarily proximate to intakes, but there are drinking water uses on these rivers. And so um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about the results from that for the first time. Um, we're really getting into data analysis and interpretation. And I think the good news story from this is that we only detected microcystin in two of our study sites, and they are in the Midwest. They're indicated here by the stars in the Mississippi River and in the Kansas River in Kansas. Um, however, we also went and we looked for the genetic potential for toxin production. So we were looking if, if the the communities that were there were able to produce toxin. And this slide just shows a broad summary that over the summer in 2017, all of our sites except for one had genetic potential at some point in time for toxin production. And, um, and there were multiple toxins there. This wasn't just a microcystin story. And so uh, this is exciting. Now we're asking the question, what exactly does this mean? And how do we use this information? And so to answer that, we're going to do this again this summer um, and continue to look at our data and, and uh, build this data set and hopefully expand what we're doing. Um, this is the first time that this has been looked at in large rivers in this way across the nation. And it's the first time that the genetic data have been used in this way. And so this is really exciting and something that we're really excited about. So Tom talked a lot about the water quality sensors that we use and uh, gave some great case studies of the fact that the water quality sensors um, really show promise as early warning tools for blooms. Um, we have a, our nationwide water quality sensor network. Right now, about 65 of our sites are equipped with chlorophyll, um, which is a good indicator, um, not necessarily good as some of the other pigment sensors that we have out there. But we're looking at a range of different site types and exploring how we can use these data. And again, Tom gave some great examples of how these data are being used. Um, we can use these data. Um, Really, this is just reiterating what Tom said. We can use these data just by looking at the patterns that we see there. And he focused specifically on the um, cyanobacterial pigment sensor and the seismograph that we see in Milford Lake. There are other patterns there that we can see in other variables. Oftentimes, when we have an algal bloom, dissolved oxygen and pH concentrations will vary substantially. We can look at that and see, you know, if we're looking at something like we see on the upper... Um, graph here, that might be an indicator that there's something going on and you might want to pay attention or go out and collect a sample or investigate further. The other thing that we can do with the continuous water quality data is really start to look at long-term patterns and trends over time. So the lower graph is showing chlorophyll concentration in another reservoir in Kansas. And we actually have um, continuous nearly 20 years of water quality data from that reservoir and it's continuous. So we can start to tease out the patterns and trends that we're seeing over time and look for anomalies and start to link the conditions associated with those anomalies and really get at some of that understanding behind the causes. Another thing that we can do with the continuous water quality data that Tom talked about is develop these um, surrogate relations to act as indicators in early warning systems. An indicator in early warning, um, I think, is really important in management because it starts to allow a movement away from reactive approaches to these events to proactive. So if you're paying attention to your, um, your sensor data, you could say, oh, maybe I need to increase sampling frequency. Maybe I need to start looking at ways I can adjust or prepare for an event in my drinking water treatment facility. Tom gave an example of how we use linear associations to actually map microcystin concentrations. Another thing that we've been able to do at several sites um, across the nation is use a logistic approach where we're actually um, measuring the probability of an event occurrence. And so in the graph here that is on the left is just the probability that microcystin, really it's the probability that microcystin is going to be detected in a system. So the black line is a probability and then the red dots were um, actual measured microcystin concentrations. Um, we're working on a couple different ways to deliver this kind of information to our collaborators and partners. Um, one is through our national real-time water quality website, which is on the upper right. 
and that is just basically it's giving the probability. And so whoever is using that information can look and say, oh, the probability of occurrence is 20% and make a decision for themselves on, on whether 20% is when they want to take action or they're going to wait until the probability is higher. Um, the other uh, is through our now casting system. And there are several sites um, like Gary that are using this, and we're starting to integrate um, some of the cyanotoxin information there as well. And these sites instead have uh, basically a color coding approach rather than probability. It's do doing some categorization. So, and these are tools that we're working on and we're developing. And um, we're really excited about them, but we're still learning best practices um, on optimal use and how these data can, can be used what's the, and what are our best practices. This is just an example of looking at um, one of the sensor data. This is the cyanobacteria pigment. And we're looking at compared to microcystin concentrations. And we know that this doesn't hold up. Across, like We can't just make one national relationship and say this is what it is. These are very site-specific relations. But this is information from one site in Lake Erie and depending on how you parse the data, you see different patterns. And so again, that's something that we're really working on is what are the best practices and um, the best way to use these to maximize the information that we're getting. So I'm going to talk about, this is something um, that we're working on that, that I'm really excited about. Um, the cyanobacteria have um, different hyperspectral signatures. We talked a little bit after Tom's talks about drone technology. There's a lot that we can do with drones. Um, but the cyanobacteria have unique hyperspectral signatures. And so you can put them under a microscope and actually generate a library of like hyperspectral fingerprints for different types of, of algae. And so on the upper left are two different types of cyanobacteria. One's a phantasomenon and one is microcystis. And then in the middle is just what the, the hyperspectral fingerprint is. And then on the lower right is a micrograph showing that you can indeed differentiate between um, the microcystis and the phenomenon based on the hyperspectral fingerprint. And so that's really cool. Um, but I think the real, um, the real potential application that we're looking at here is that you can then um, mount a hyperspectral camera onto some kind of aerial-based platform and fly over an area, whether it's an individual lake or whether it's a region. And you can start to get a better idea and a better understanding of how much cyanobacteria are out there and what the composition is. And if you have cyanobacteria out there that aren't known to produce toxins, maybe you don't need to pay as much attention there. Maybe you need to focus in, in the regions and the areas where you have toxin uh, potential toxin producers. So again, this is something that we are working on. I, I wish I had examples to show you of this, but this is something that right now we're working on developing some of those hyperspectral libraries and looking for opportunities to um, test out that particular approach. Um, the other thing that is really neat about this is that it ties together. I talked to about genetics, I talked about cells, and now we're taking information and we're moving in scale to aerial aircraft. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is satellites. So again, we're using a lot of different tools to study this particular issue. Um, USGS is collaborating with EPI, NASA, and NOAA on the Santa Bacterial Assessment Network project. And the ultimate goal of that project is to take satellite-derived information and turn it into something that's very usable and accessible to everyone through something like a mobile application to get information about a site of interest. And I think right now the, the vision is to have some kind of mobile app that, again, has a kind of a stoplight system where red would indicate there's a potential problem and green would, be, would indicate that um, but there's, there's probably not an issue. Um, this project is, I believe, in the in third year of five-year study, and there's a lot of great information products um, and potential applications coming out of this study. Um, these are two different examples on the left. It's just a satellite scene, one from Lake Erie and then one from in Florida. And a cyanobacteria index has been used, so areas where there are cooler colors, cyanobacterial abundance is low, 
areas with red color showing up bacterial abundance is high. And on the left, that's just one snapshot, so one point in time. But this kind of information could be used, if we focus in on the state of Florida, it could be used to, um, say, if you have limited monitoring resources, you could focus in on those sites where you have red instead of the, instead of the um, cooler colors. Or you could just say, well, it looks like there's lakes here that are experiencing some issues and maybe we need to pay more attention. The other thing, once these approaches are developed, the other thing that we can do is do retrospective analysis of satellite imagery and actually start to look at um, the history of blooms and lakes. And a lot of places we don't have good records of bloom events. And so on the right here, this is focusing on Florida. And again, the cooler colors are lower um, frequency of occurrence and the warmer colors are a higher frequency but this is looking at across all of the satellite imagery that were available on this scale if you're on the warmer end or at the upper end there is always cyanobacteria in those lakes and so again this is another tool that we can use to really start to ask some different questions and go back go back in time and look at what was happening in places where we might not have data on the ground. And so our science um, is really focused across three different areas. Um, we're continually developing field and lab methods to identify and quantify cyanobacteria and other algae um, that cause harmful algal bloom events. Um, we are doing science to understand causal factors, look at occurrence in environmental fate and transport, ecological processes and effects of environmental exposure, and we're also working on developing early warning systems and tools for potentially harmful blooms, again, so we can move from reactive management approaches to proactive management approaches. And I think one of the really um, exciting things about where the state of the science is right now for harmful algal bloom research is that our studies are integrated and we're using everything from information at the cellular level to the satellite level to inform our science and inform the direction that we're going. So while I'm switching it up, Paul, you can come on up. We're going to change gears a little bit here. And um, Paul Capel is with the USGS. He works with the National Water Quality Program. He's also an adjunct professor up at the University of Minnesota in their civil, environmental, and geoengineering. Geoengineering. Department. We just added you. I know. I saw that. So that's impressive. He's been working with the NACWA program for, what, over 20 years or so. He led in cycle two our agricultural chemical transport uh, topical study which really focused on the hydrology of different ag settings across the country and how that impacted transport of um, ag chemicals, nutrients, pesticides, etc. And we asked him in the cycle three, this current decade, to head up our integrated watershed study team and they're really focusing on kind of three areas of advancing what we've done in the past which include looking at you know a nutrient interaction from a surface water groundwater interaction perspective um, looking at how we can apply some of this continuous sensor data, particularly nitrate type sensors, high frequency data to apply it to our modeling <laughs> efforts, and then integrating all this information into um, coupled models, dynamic models of surface and groundwater um, that can be used to develop forecasts of future water quality conditions. So, you know, no easy task there uh, that he's taken on. But they've been working in a couple locations around the country. Um, Chesapeake Bay and up uh, in, the, in the glacial systems in the upper Midwest. And uh, he'll talk today uh, mostly on the uh, Chesapeake Bay work, which we thought was relevant to this part of the world. So, Since most of you live in Chesapeake Bay, right? Exactly. <laughs> We're actually the watershed is this one. Yep. So, there you go. All right, well, thanks. As Gary said, I'm going to uh, change the focus here. We'll talk about the nutrient part of uh, algal blooms. And uh, it's uh, something that's widespread across the country, uh, including Chesapeake Bay, both in the watershed, uh, in the freshwater, and in, in the estuary. This is a, a picture that uh, was photographed from somebody from VIMS uh, in one of the areas uh, in the bay. So Tom showed the same cartoon about the processes that are important to algal blooms. And there's uh, chemical processes and environmental processes and hydrologic things. Uh, so the residence time of the water body, its interaction with the sediment, uh, weather, the temperature, sunlight, uh, wind, 
but there's also a lot of watershed processes and these uh, particularly are things that would move nutrients from the watershed uh, to the water body. So that I highlighted the ones here in pink uh, that uh, are specific to the nutrients. Uh, it's been suggested that the nutrients are the only real control we have over algal blooms. These uh, hydrologic things like residence time and weather, we don't, we're kind of out of our control. So if we are going to actively try to manage the blooms, it's the nutrient piece that becomes really important. Um, at the bottom here, just to uh, again highlight the importance of the nutrients, I took the uh, kind of um, the typical biomass for an algal cell, and you'll see that both nitrogen and phosphorus are integral components of the algae itself, right? And so uh, they become then integral parts of how the uh, bloom uh, forms and works. So I'm going to talk mostly or all about the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, one reason is that you guys, the, the activity here and, and, uh, in Chesapeake Bay uh, has this wonderful data set. Uh, and so from a national perspective, we're taking Chesapeake Bay and kind of looking at it as an example to develop models and tools uh, based on the data that exists here that we can then take to other parts of the country. Uh, so it's kind of the guinea pig uh, for NACWA. Uh, Part of that rich data set is due to the uh, TMDL that was established in uh, 2010 and uh, essentially to put the bay on a nutrient diet. Because you guys are all very well of that and, and the reductions are in the orders of 25% for nitrogen and phosphorus over this time period from 2009 uh, to 2025. Uh, it's really hard to uh, estimate, to get numbers on, on what that means economically. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation suggests that if they actually fulfilled these TMDLs, it would be benefit something like, what was it, $22, $22 billion annually. Okay, so it's, it's uh, important both from an environmental perspective but also from an uh, economic perspective. So what I'd like to do is kind of give some big picture of uh, the nutrients, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, in the watershed and contributing to the bay, and then uh, focus on a couple of stories about the importance of storage in the system and how that uh, ultimately affects uh, our ability to control nutrients. So this is a model, this is a results from the, the recent Sparrow model uh, for the Chesapeake Bay and, and the y-axis here is uh, total load delivered to the local watershed, so this is numbers without loss in the streams. Okay. And there's two sets of graph here, one compares 1992 to 2012, so this 20 year period, what's happened to uh, nitrogen in the bay in terms of its sources and then we'll talk about the graph that's closest to me in a second. And so uh, the way this model works is it attributes the nitrogen to cropland pasture, developed areas, uh, atmospheric deposition, and to point sources. So if we look at these two, uh, 1992 and 2000, this 20 year period, we see that indeed there has been this reduction of nitrogen exported from the watershed to the bay. So from that perspective, it's a strong success story. Uh, but if we look a little bit closer, most of that reduction has happened in point sources. Uh, our control of the wastewater treatment plants uh, in certain areas. Uh, the other sources have reduced a little, but not necessarily uh, that substantially. So kind of the big picture of, of nitrogen. The other way we can look at nitrogen is by how it gets to the stream. And so here I've divided uh, into three areas. Water, uh, nitrogen contributed through groundwater pathways to the stream. Water contributed to stormwater or runoff quick flow uh, resulting from storm events or point sources. And so about 30% of the water across, nitrogen from across the bay comes through this groundwater pathway. And about 15% comes through the point source pathway and the rest comes through this um, uh, stormwater. And I'll try to draw a couple implications for that at the end. So if we put this spatially, how does this look spatially? The numbers on the, the far, um, that side over there, uh, kind of map out where the, uh, the nutrients uh, are coming from their sources. Uh, the darker colors, the blue, are the higher sources of nitrate. So it's not an even distribution across the watershed in terms of the, the source of nutrients. The Delmarva Peninsula and then uh, up into this carbonate area in uh, Pennsylvania here, 
uh, contribute uh, significant amounts of the total load. One thing we're able to do with this model is look at where this reduction has taken place and stuff. And here, the red colors are increases over that 20 year period. The green colors are decreases over that 20 year period. So again, we have seen this kind of uneven distribution of how the nitrogen loads have changed. Uh, and we'll find out that a lot of these red areas here are where groundwater becomes a very important part of the picture for nitrogen. And uh, so there's this source that has been stored in the, the nitrogen system. We can do the same sort of thing for phosphorus. Again, uh, here the sources are uh, agricultural sources developed, uh, mineral sources, so natural phosphate minerals that are in the system, and point sources. There is no atmospheric piece to the, the phosphorus. Again, we've seen this overall reduction uh, to the bay over this 20 year time period. And again, most of that reduction has taken place in uh, the point sources, the, the upgrades of the wastewater treatment plants, rather than across the landscape. And we have a similar map where we can look at what the difference between the, the 20 year period is. And so again, we see this uneven distribution, greater uh, contributions in certain parts of the watershed and improved contributions in the other parts of the watershed. So I'd like to stick with phosphorus for a minute and, and, and talk a little bit about uh, it in more detail and uh, how we think it's uh, moving to the bay and, and, and talk about one specific example. <coughs> so here's the, the bay watershed and all these dots here are the various uh, river sampling sites that we have this historic record where we can look at what the trends are in this case from 2007 to 2016. So kind of at the beginning of the TMDL period and then on a decade in uh, sort of if we look at this bar chart over here, this is essentially the river sites in the Susquehanna. So I just clipped that off just to make it a little bit see. Uh, you can see that there are sites that are uh, decreasing over this time period, uh, probably from a combination of implementation of best management practices uh, and removal of agriculture from uh, removal of land from active agriculture, particularly in, in the upper parts of New York. Uh, but it's uneven. It, it varies from uh, stream to stream uh, through the watershed. And it's interesting to, to see this part down in the lower Susquehanna here uh, that actually has many sites that are, are increasing over this time period. And these first three here of this quartet are small rivers uh, in south um, eastern Pennsylvania. And so these are kind of uh, difficult areas under control. They're, they're actually uh, this part is, is uh, um, struggling to uh, have these decreases. But what I want to talk about here is this last one here, which is the sampling site at the exit of Conowingo Con Dam. Okay, so this is a, a topic that has got a lot of uh, uh, talk, I think, in the, um, recent times in this area and its uh, effect on the nutrient cycling to the bay and stuff. And so, I thought it would be worth just kind of telling the story and, and talking about it and this idea of, of storage in the system and how that kind of uh, impacts our ability to control the nutrients exports to the bay. So at the lower part of the Susquehanna, uh, starting in the Marietta, uh, there are a series of, of three reservoirs that were put in the early 1900s and uh, they had lots of purposes, hydropower, flood control, drinking water supply for Baltimore. Uh, one of the probably non-planned purposes is the sediment trapping and protection of the bay from sediment and phosphorus. And so it has then accumulated over this uh, century period. But we've reached kind of a tipping point within the last uh, few years. And so uh, these two lines over here represent sampling at the upstream of the reservoirs in Marietta and then downstream at the release of the series of reservoirs in Conowingo. And so you can see the blue line, the concentrations, or, or this is actually loads, uh, annual loads are higher coming into the system in these early years here than lower. And so what has happened is that the sediment has lost in the water and accumulated in the bed sediment. And so this has been essentially a protection, a removal 
of a couple million tons of phosphorus uh, each year uh, over that time period. But in recent years, we've entered a system where there is no longer active storage of sediment and phosphorus uh, in the reservoir systems. They've essentially filled up. And so we've reached this point where the reservoirs are either acting neutrally or actually contributing phosphorus to the system. And so if we do this kind of in a cartoon fashion, in the early part of the 1990s and well before when the sediment uh, was, when the water was deeper and there was less sediment, uh, something like about 50% of the sediment of the phosphorus was trapped uh, in the reservoir. As we moved uh, to the early 2000s, uh, that reduced to about 40%, and then about 2010-2012, uh, we kind of had this crossover point where the reservoirs are no longer trapping uh, the phosphorus, but it's kind of entering and releasing more or less at the same rate. So from a nutrient perspective, what we've done is lost a really big control, and uh, which is kind of against what the TMDL is trying to say. And so this is a, a controversy, or not a controversy, but a, a challenge, I think, to the water quality managers. And this is not just unique to the Conowingo in Pennsylvania. There's reservoirs all over the country that have been trapping phosphorus for decades. And so it's going to be a new part of the piece of, I think, dealing with these nutrients uh, in the reservoirs across the country. So let's switch stories to uh, nitrogen. Okay. So same sort of map. <coughs> I added here the sampling sites on the eastern shore. Uh, just I want to talk a little bit about them. And so you can see again, there's this kind of mixed bag in various streams of, of nitrogen improving uh, or not improving. But in general, nitrogen has been a more of a success story in this part of Susquehanna where there's a lot more decreases over this time period. Uh, but we see these cluster of sites on the eastern shore where we have seen uh, increases in nitrogen. And uh, so we want to look at this a little bit more. And here, uh, the, the thought is that this is due to storage of nitrogen that has been used over the last few decades in the groundwater. Mm -hmm. The nitrate is much more mobile uh, than compared to phosphorus. It moves uh, through the subsurface, <coughs> through the, the soil into the subsurface, and can get trapped in the groundwater. And so over this time period, as we've been putting nitrogen on the landscape, some small fraction of it has moved to the subsurface. And now we've built up this reservoir of nitrogen in the subsurface. And as, as it releases to the streams, it provides essentially a steady uh, underlying amount of, of nitrogen that moves through the system. And so we've done some modeling based on observations in streams at base flow across the, the watershed uh, by looking at aquifer types and land uses and have been able to uh, develop a model to estimate what the spatial concentrations across the bay would be uh, for the groundwater. We can take that, so again, so there's areas that have relatively high concentrations, particularly under some of the agricultural areas on the, on the coastal plains, uh, in the sands, and in the carbonate uh, aquifers where the water moves uh, fairly readily. We can take these results and combine them with the sparrow models that we looked at earlier and start estimating what percent of the annual stream load for any given area would come through the groundwater. So a good idea in terms of thinking about control and management stuff. <coughs> so the yellow colors here are about 50% of the annual load coming through groundwater. The green areas are less, the red areas are more. And so there are significant areas that have uh, both as high concentration and, and the, uh, discharge to the streams where groundwater uh, is an important player of the overall nitrogen budget. So if we take this kind of one more step, we can start apportioning the sources of where we see nitrogen in the streams coming from. So the far one over there is the total stream load of nitrogen map spatially here. Uh, this would be the groundwater component coming up. Uh, this is the, the point source loads that we know from data collected uh, uh, for the EPA permitting process for wastewater treatment discharges. And so then the difference then here would be the 
storm load or the quick flow, the, the water that runs off the landscape and into the, the stream. And so you can see, again, that, that there's areas where groundwater is very important to the overall uh, picture, and uh, particularly on the eastern shore. So this is why we think that we haven't seen this decline over the last decade like we've seen in other parts of, of the Bay Area. So if we have this ability to kind of apportion the, the nitrogen in the stream by both uh, source, whether it be from an agricultural source or an urban source or a point source, and by flow path, coming through overland flow, through stormwater or through groundwater or through uh, point sources, we can start kind of teasing out and thinking about what the implications are that for water quality management. So for this uh, example, uh, catchment that I uh, uh, show here, uh, there is about uh, two-thirds or so of the nitrogen coming through overland storm, uh, stormwater type processes, about 10% from point sources, and about 25% or so from groundwater. <laughs> and since this is an agricultural catchment, the lot, a lot of the nitrogen is coming ultimately from an agricultural source. So it's interesting to think about this from a water quality management perspective is that point sources, we can make big investments and have immediate effects of, of where the improvement in the nitrogen loads are. Stormwater is what we've been really focusing on, I think, in the last I don't know, decade or so. Best management practices for agricultural areas, uh, best management practices for urban areas and stuff. And so this is where we put a lot of focus of, of trying to control the export of nitrogen from the watershed to the stream. The groundwater piece poses a challenge because what's in the groundwater, we don't really have any effective way of, of controlling that source to the stream. And so there we need to kind of readjust, I think, our mindset about what's uh, able to happen under our control and then think about you know, the age of the groundwater as it comes out. So this nitrogen groundwater may come out in some areas in the next few years, in other areas, like on the Delmarva, it may be over the next few decades. Right? And so uh, it's a, an adjustment, and as we think about controlling nutrients to the bay for algal blooms, there's this uh, limitation that the groundwater uh, imposes on us. So one of the trying to, things we're trying to do is think ahead. So from a decadal time scale, can we start thinking about what would be the loads of nitrogen going to the bay given different types of uh, future scenarios. And these future scenarios might be things like changes in land use and climate, atmospheric deposition, which are kind of regional changes out of the control of local water quality managers, and then things like agricultural management and urban management and control of point sources. So there's been a lot of work on climate and land use in terms of what the future projections are this is uh, from a USGS colleague of uh, future land use projections around Washington. The gray areas are the existing development, and the red is what would be new by 2050, uh, given a certain growth projection. And so we can start taking this sort of information and, and uh, thinking about the future, and ultimately what we want to do is a map uh, like this to be able to say, given this future, what would be the change in loads from, say, 2010 to 2050 to help people plan for uh, water quality needs for the Bay for the future. So this is uh, an area that we're actively working on right now. One of the things that we've got into uh, in the process of doing this is to ask the question, uh, given land use changes, remote control for it, Given uh, changes that, that are likely to take place, that is changes in land use or our decisions to implement best management practices, comparatively, how important are they going to be to this overall change? That is, is an implementation of a BMP on agricultural land equivalent to uh, a land use change elsewhere in the Bay? So this is what we're trying to do in this. Here, the graph on the side here is change in uh, nitrogen yield to the stream, so the amount of nitrogen you can yield. The, this is a zero bar. Below that would be decreases in nitrogen. Um, above the bar, the horizontal bar would be increases. 
And so we played out, I think there's 16 different kind of changes that uh, are probably expected in different places uh, across the Bay watershed or across the country. Uh, things like agricultural land being converted to uh, CRP or undeveloped land, agricultural land being converted to urban uh, landscape, which is uh, a big process that's going on here. And so those are actually very uh, positive changes in terms of decreasing the load. Uh, you think of urbanization as a uh, best management practice for nitrogen uh, control, right? That we lose agricultural land to urban. It's actually a good thing in terms of, uh, likely a good thing in terms of the, the uh, nitrogen contribution. On the other hand, the big things that are off the graph here are conversion of undeveloped land to developed land, either urban or agricultural. So these are the things that have the potential to work against us most in terms of, of controlling nutrients uh, in the system. And interesting, a lot of the things kind of in the middle that are pretty neutral are things that we've been uh, focusing a lot on, particularly the implementation of best managed practices in urban and agriculture areas. Uh, they're important, they decrease it, but relative to uh, the importance of things like land use change, uh, it may not just be, they may not be that effective. So that kind of uh, brings me back to the, the algal blooms and thinking about nitrogen is really the knob that we have to control nitrogens and that the nutrients are intimately linked to the algal blooms and uh, we can go back to the discussion for the morning with the, the algal blooms. Thanks. Right, thanks, Paul.